Welcome to the Asiana 50th anniversary celebration. My name is Jim Vandernoot. I've been a member of the Wizard of Oz Club since 1983, when I found the club after a lifelong uh, passion for collecting Oz books and reading all the stories. I'm going to read to you today from the 1985 issue of Oziana, a story that I wrote uh, called The Ice Cream Man of Oz, which was illustrated by Robert Lures. I have to do it this year. I just have to, thought Leonard Triton as he pushed back his chair from the dinner table and patted his stomach contentedly. Aloud, he said, Year after year, I've wanted to do something special on behalf of our village for Ozma's birthday. And this time I think I've got an idea. And what might that be? Inquired his pretty wife, Luzanne, in a skeptical tone. Shaking back her shiny red curls, she continued drying and stacking the dinner dishes. I thought I might make one of my ice cream sculptures, dear, ventured her husband but not the usual kind. This one must be something spectacular and entertaining, and it should be big enough that all of the guests at Ozma's celebration can have a taste. Now, in order to thoroughly understand how this remarkable idea of Leonard Triton's came about, it is necessary to mention that in Oz, unlike the civilized world, People had none of the modern refrigerators and freezers with which we are familiar. Instead, each family owned an old fashioned ice box in which they kept foods that were ready to eat. Freezing could only be done by placing foods inside special amethyst colored cold crystals that grew high atop a mountain in the Gillikin country and were so rare that it was customary for only one man in each village, the town freezer, to possess a quantity of them. Leonard Triton had been appointed the town freezer of his native village in the quadling farmlands that bordered on the Emerald City. And each week the townspeople would bring him their fresh chickens, vegetables, sauces, and other things that needed freezing which he would store in the cold crystals until the owners were ready to defrost them. Because of this system, ice cream was considered a rare treat and a delicacy. And to pass the time when there was no freezing to be done, Leonard had learned the craft of making ice cream. And he spent many hours sculpting it into roses, birds, and other shapes that struck his fancy. With practice, he became quite an artist and he was often called upon to design desserts for children's birthdays and other occasions. But always they were little projects and couldn't compare with the grandiose plan Leonard was evolving for Ozma's birthday present. In all fairness, we must say that Leonard Triton was a handsome, cordial, family-minded man. And indeed, part of the reason for his decision to create Ozma's present this year stemmed from his affection for his eight-year-old son, Leon. For the respect that Leonard might earn by presenting Ozma with such a unique gift would be equally shared by his family. And Leonard recalled how much he had yearned for that type of attention when he was Leon's age. Now, I suspect that deep down, Leonard was really longed to be in the spotlight himself. But being a good father and a mo modest husband, he would never admit it. And so it was that only a week before Ozma's birthday, Leonard Triton secreted himself in his cold room workshop and began a most marvelous undertaking. It will be in the shape of a man, he thought, for that will entertain our sovereign and delight all the children. 
So he began to shape the various parts. From chocolate ice cream, he fashioned two brown shoes. With peppermint stripe, he shaped several cylinders that would go together for the legs, while pumpkin and peach were used for the arms. The head was carefully carved from a large block of butterscotch to which Leonard added two almonds for eyes, a cherry nose, and a row of chocolate chips for the mouth. Oreo cookies, yes, they have those in Oz, affixed to either side of the head served as ears, and swirls of chocolate jimmies created a very debonair hairdo. But it was his idea for the hands that pleased Leonard the most. The palms and left thumb were sculpted from vanilla ice cream, while the other thumb and the fingers were each made of a different flavor. One was strawberry, one peach. There were pistachio chocolate, chocolate chip, rum raisin, cherry vanilla, butter pecan, and even Rocky Road. Brimming with satisfaction, the town freezer laid all the pieces out on a cold bench in preparation for assembling his creation when a terrible realization struck him. While the cold cubes were fine for keeping all the separate parts frozen, none of them was big enough to hold the entire sculpture. And how would he manage to keep it from melting on the trip to the Emerald City? Poking his head out of the workshop, he called to Leon. Son, would you be good enough to run down and ask Herba Liss if she's got a preservative that'll keep my ice cream solid for about a week? Don't tell her too much because it's got to stay a secret. Just say it's for a big piece of ice cream. Okay, dad, replied the boy, and he ran off toward the house of Herba Liss, the village pharmacist while his father went back to work on the ice cream man. When Leon entered the apothecary shop, a cheerful little bell above the door tinkled his arrival. Behind a glass counter in which were displayed candied fruits and other confections, sat the proprietress of the establishment, her gray streaked chestnut hair primly rolled into a neat bun spectacles resting far down the, near the tip of her slender nose as she read intently through a stack of prescriptions waiting to be filled. Hi, Miss Liss, piped the lad expectantly. The white cafe curtains billowed in the breeze that came through the open windows, and it seemed to the boy that it took an age before the elderly lady raised her head to acknowledge him. Well, if it isn't young Leon, exclaimed Herba Liss. And what shall it be today, my boy? She queried in a wrinkled smile. The good woman had always had a fondness for children and was especially friendly with Leon's family. My dad's making a big ice cream statue, puffed Leon importantly and he needs something that will keep the ice cream fresh and solid until Ozma's birthday. I see, a special surprise perhaps. The lady's eyes twinkled through the half moons of her spectacles. Well, I think I have just the ticket. Keep the ice cream fresh for a week. That shouldn't be too difficult. Now, let me see. As she spoke, Herba began rummaging through the oak shelves that lined the back wall of the shop, all of which were crammed with assorted vials and jars that held liquids, powders, and herbs of various colors and consistencies. Meanwhile, Goober, the pharmacy's large orange cat, hearing the sound of Leon's voice, padded out from the back storeroom and leapt upon the counter to let the boy stroke him and scratch him behind the ears. Ah, a custom cooler. 
That's what I shall mix for your father. It won't work nearly as well as the cold crystals, but for just a week, it should do the job. Hmm. She searched along one of the rows of bottles. Chillblains. Aha, here it is, big chill. Reaching down a vial from the shelf, Herba poured a few grains of powder onto a piece of parchment and replacing the vial, continued to search. Let's see, spine chillers. Awfully good for a sore back, but it should definitely keep the ice cream cool and, and give it some backbone to withstand moving about. A small amount of this powder was added to the parchment. Leon watched, fascinated, as the knowledgeable old lady looked through her ingredients, selecting those most appropriate for the purpose at hand. And there's just one more thing. No compound would be complete without a preservative, declared Herba waltzing down to the far end of her shelves. Squinting through her glasses, the woman examined two or three bottles before pulling down the one she wanted. This temperature stabilizer, which is so useful in keeping the living room or the bath water at a constant temperature, should make the other ingredients give off a consistent chill. Herba poured a generous dose of the clear flaky substance from the bottle, little realizing that her failing eyesight had misread the label and that in actuality, she had selected her temperament stabilizer, usually prescribed for excitable folk to keep them even tempered and above all, to keep them from changing their mind. Mixing the ingredients together with a palette knife, the woman folded the parchment neatly and sealing it with a strip of tape, handed it to the boy. Now I've been very careful not to give you too much chill, asserted Herbalist, looking straight at Leon. Otherwise your father's ice cream would be frozen too solid to eat. And even as it is, I'm going to have to give you another compound to sprinkle over it before serving. Turning back to her shelves, the elderly lady seemed to delight in the task at hand. For as much as she enjoyed her usual work, most of the orders she received were repetitious and she reveled in the idea of concocting a new remedy. Leon marveled at the skill with which Herba selected first one ingredient, then another, to form just the compound that his father would need to complete his big project. It has just occurred to me, remarked Herba, that this is the perfect opportunity to use the spice of ice. It was given to me several years ago by a traveler from the far off town of Iceberg, and I've never known what to do with it. I'm sure your father won't mind, Leon, as it should give a little extra flavor to his creation. So saying, the lady reached up to the very top of her cabinets, stretching so far that her glasses slid way down her nose, and the label she thought said spice of ice, really read spice of life. Herba emptied nearly the whole of this bottle into a new parchment, thinking to keep just a few grains of the powder in case it should turn out to be useful. Next, I think we want a little pinch of heart warmer, she continued reaching practically up to the ceiling to receive, retrieve a globe-shaped globe bottle, her spectacles slipping off the end of her nose in the process. Uncorking the bottle, Herba replaced her glasses and stopped just as she was about to begin pouring. Hello, dear me, 
Lucky I've got my glasses on, she said to Leon. I almost put in a dose of hearth warmer by mistake. It would make a fabulous flambe, but somehow I don't think that's quite what your father had in mind. Ah, now here's what I wanted. Having found the right vial, Herba measured out a small sample. Now for the final touch, I'm going to add an extra helping of my meta mega nimble amble dextrose, which is a marvelous preservative and one of the best sweeteners I've ever come across. This vial contained a liquid, but when Herba poured it over the parchments, the other powders began to sparkle without a trace of wetness. There you go, said Herba Liss, sealing the second packet and presenting it to Leon. Looking him squarely in the eye, she lifted her finger in warning. Now be sure to tell your father that he must sprinkle this powder on the sculpture when it's ready to be eaten, but not a moment sooner or it may lose its shape. I've marked the envelope with a red tape so you will know which is which. Thanking the old lady, Leon gave the orange cat a farewell pat and slipped out the door. Give my regards to your father, Herba called after him. With a sigh and a smile, the old lady thought to herself that if she had ever had children, she have, would have wanted them to be just like Leon. That Le Leonard Triton is such a lucky man to have such a fine family, Herba mused, watching the boy run up the path. Then she readjusted her spectacles and turned her attention back to the stack of prescriptions on the counter. By the time Leon returned with the powders, his father had completed an ornately carved armchair of fudge marble and was arranging the ice cream man in the seat. Herba's powder appeared to do its job properly and well pleased with his creation, Leonard hid the ice cream man behind his cold crystals, storing the second packet of powder away until it was needed. Ozma's birthday dawned bright and clear. Such was the level of excitement in the Triton household that the whole family was up at the first light of day and soon Leonard had gathered up Herba's second preparation and moved the ice cream man from the cold room to a canopied cart, keeping it covered all the while with a red satin sheet. As soon as the horse was harnessed and Luzanne and Leon were, was re were ready, the family departed and by noontime they passed through the gates of the fabulous Emerald City. Everywhere, Ozites lined the streets in celebration, sporting gaily colored costumes, waving banners and cheering. Leonard quickly found the starting point for Ozma's birthday parade in which all who desired were invited to march down the palace boulevard and pay homage to the girl ruler. Taking their place in the procession, the family marched along proudly. And when they passed the reviewing stand where all the important court, court personages sat, Leonard unveiled his ice cream man and extended a low bow in Ozma's direction. At the end of the parade route, an official looking footman informed him that Ozma had been very impressed with his artistry and had invited Leonard and his family to join her table for the birthday banquet. Leonard, Luzanne, and Leon were taken into the palace to freshen up while a servant looked after their cart. And then they were led into the magnificent mirrored banquet hall to join the festivities already underway. 
Ozma's table occupied the center of the great hall, which was walled with tall mirrors framed with draperies of green silk. The other tables in the room were reserved for the children of Oz, with a grown up seated at either end to supervise the meal. Through the windows at the far end of the hall, Leonard could see scores of tables in the gardens where the rest of the Ozites were being served. And he was glad to notice as he took his seat that the ice cream man had been placed on a pr prominently on a dais at the foot of Ozma's table. The meal was splendidly delicious. Of course, Ozma sat at the head of the table, flanked by Glinda the Good and the famous Wizard of Oz. The Scarecrow, Tin Woodman, Jack Pumpkinhead, and other celebrities who did not eat sat, had been evenly spaced about the table in order to keep the conversation lively while the rest of the company enjoyed the feast. Luzanne was impressed with the knowledge and the wit of the scarecrow who sat to her left, while little Leon's eyes were popping at all the unusual and curious looking personages. Across from them was a large table laid with bowls and plates of unusual shapes and sizes. Around it clustered several large animals. Among them, Leonard recognized the Cowardly Lion, Hank the Mule, Belina the Yellow Hen, and the famous Boozy. A constant parade of waiters attended the Hungry Tiger, who seemed to empty every plate almost before it was set in front of him. When the main course had been cleared away, Ozma spoke to the guests, I thank you all, dear friends and subjects, for making this such a wonderful celebration. And this year, I must extend a special thank you to Leonard Triton, who has so cleverly made us a beautiful man out of ice cream to go with our cake. Indeed, his village is lucky to have such a remarkable and talented man for their town freezer. Rising to his feet, Leonard gave a polite bow and addressed the princess. I am glad that my efforts have pleased you, your highness, and my family and I are grateful to be here as your guests. But now, if I may have just a moment, my sculpture has been treated with a preservative and must be suitably prepared before it can be served. To this, Ozma gave a nod of acknowledgement, and Leonard walked over to the ice cream man, pulling Urba's other packet from his vest. After covering his creation with a very generous sprinkling of the powder, Leonard Triton stepped back to make room for the palace head waiter to carve up the dessert. A line of men servants formed beside the dais where the ice cream man sat, all decked out in brilliant green uniforms, holding gilded bowls in their outstretched hands, their forearms neatly draped with fresh linen serving cloths. The head waiter, smartly dressed in a dark green suit, bald except for a sprig of a gray-green cowlick, approached the ice cream man with a jeweled knife and prepared to make the first incision across the right hand shoulder. My dear sir, would you be good enough to point that thing elsewhere? The ice cream man turned and flashed the head waiter an icy glare, at the same time brushing aside the knife blade with his arm all of which happened with such suddenness that the poor servant stumbled and nearly fainted from shock. Really, my good man, continued the statue, I don't think you should like it were I to take a knife to you. Please put it away and have a seat and enjoy the party. But the last words were lost among the hubbub that ensued for the children were howling with laughter 
while oohs and ahs and murmurs of, oh my dear, escaped the mouths of the adults. Amid the confusion, Scraps, the patchwork girl, cartwheeled down to the end of the table and with an acrobatic leap, balanced herself on the arm of the ice cream chair, standing on one hand while she pointed with the other at the ice cream man's cherry nose. You're a man of pure ice cream and I'm a girl who's full of scenes. If you could plot and I could scheme together, we'd make quite a team. With that, Scraps gave a little scream of delight and turned handsprings all the way back to her seat. By this time, the laughter of the children had given way to crying, for they had realized they wouldn't get any ice cream. And the poor town freezer was wringing his hands in despair at the thought that his beautiful dessert might get up and walk away. Meanwhile, Ozma waited for the company to quiet down. Friends, she began when the noise had subsided enough for her to be heard. This is indeed a surprise and a very clever one at that. But no matter how good his intentions, Leonard Triton has not only deprived the children of his ice cream, but has also practiced magic, which is forbidden by the laws of Oz. It is with great regret that I must punish a subject who has heretofore been so loyal, but he must bear the consequences of his acts. Please, your highness, pleaded the distraught man falling down on his knees before his sovereign. I didn't know. I had no idea. Oh, this is awful, he stuttered. All I wanted to do was to create a splendid dessert for you and the children. I just can't imagine what could have gone wrong unless just then Herbal Liss burst into the great hall, we waving a half-empty bottle in a frenzy. Spotting Leonard Triton on his knees be beside Ozma's chair, she ran up to him, crying, Oh, Leonard, please forgive me. Then catching sight of the ice cream man strutting around amongst the tables, she began wailing. Oh, what have I done? Dear Leonard, I'm so sorry. Just this morning I was making a tonic for a listless child, and I thought to add a bit of the spice of life, which is very good for restoring the zeal that children ought to have. I was surprised to find it nearly all gone. So I checked the bottle next to it, only to find that the spice of ice, which I thought I had given you, was still unopened. Oh, Leonard, Erba shook her head in dismay. My eyesight has been starting to fail me lately, but such a grievous mistake. I had hoped I could get here in time to help, but I see I'm too late. While Erba was explaining, some of the children had begun to clamor again for ice cream, and soon the din was so loud that the poor woman could barely make herself heard. But just then, their cries began turning to giggles. And when the rest of the company looked over to see what, is, what had happened, they beheld a most astonishing sight. The ice cream man was walking from table to table. And every time he passed a child, he removed one of his fingers and placed it in the child's dish. Owing to Herbalis's metamegal nimble ambidextrose, the removed finger at once puffed up into a big ball of ice cream, and another finger grew upon the statue's hand. Since each finger was a different flavor, the children could choose which one they liked the best. When everyone had been served, the ice cream man stopped before Ozma with a low bow. Malter be bell at your service, your highness, but please call me Malty. 
I hope I have not spoiled your party by coming alive, and I will do my best to make sure everyone gets their fill of ice cream. All these events had taken the company quite by surprise, and everyone looked attentively towards Ozma to see what would happen next. Taking a deep breath, the girl ruler flashed a charming smile at the ice cream man saying, thank you, Malty, for your kindness and consideration. Although you present a cold, hard exterior, you seem to have a warm spot in your heart for the children and it pleases me to see you serve them. However, she continued, we have a more inter important matter at hand. Leonard Triton shall not be punished since it turns out that he has done no wrong. But I fear that Herba Liss may make other mistakes in the future with serious consequences. Therefore, I shall commission the royal optician to make her a custom fitted pair of silver spectacles so that she will always be able to see correctly. And one more thing, my dear, she smiled kindly at the old lady. I must ask you to refrain from practicing your profession until you complete a course in pharmacy at the Royal College of Athletics. <clears throat> Interrupted Professor Wogglebug, rising to his feet and tipping his high silk hat. In our circles of higher learning, we refer to such a study as pharmachemicology, for it would not do to give a simple name to such a complex subject when a compound term is so readily available. Now the reader may think it inexcusably rude for the Wogglebug to interrupt Ozma's speech in this fashion, but we must remember that someone thoroughly educated naturally expects his own words to be more interesting and important than those of others around him. Whatever the proper term, laughed Ozma, I am sure you'll find the study useful and pleasant, Miss Liss. And you needn't worry about those strenuous athletics for those who have no inclination toward the physical sports supplement their lessons with games of trivia's pursuit and canasta. Herba expressed her gratitude for Ozma's fairness and the celebration resumed. The cake was served and Malty continued handing out ice cream fingers. The wizard's nine tiny piglets put on a circus show and assisted by an acrobatic troupe of monkeys who visited every year from the Gilligan country for the privilege of entertaining their ruler. Ozma's decision proved wise indeed. Erba's new glasses made all the difference in the world. And in, in the course of her studies, she became a champion canasta player, not to mention a brilliant pharmacemicologist. Her first project was to build a candy house for Malty, which was treated with a special preservative to protect it from wind and rain. Leonard Triton and his family returned home, exhausted from the events of the day. Leonard's fame grew as news of the ice cream man spread. And as the weeks went by, he found himself busier than ever before. Meanwhile, the ice cream man became good friends with Nick Chopper on account of their warm heartedness, and they visited each other quite frequently. Nick presented Malty with a tiny blue bell, which made of tin, which the ice cream man carried wherever he went. On warm days, whenever you heard the tinkling of his bell, you could always find Malty cheerfully handing out delicious ice cream fingers to flocks of eager children. Thank you for joining me and let's celebrate the 50th anniversary of 
Aziana together. <laughs>